My name is Marco Caminiti. I'm calling in from the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. And uh, thank you for the honor to be able to just give a little talk about specifically orthognathic surgery with clear liners. Uh, patients have really embraced clear liner significantly. It has changed and transformed orthodontic practices over the past 10 years. Many patients will present with dental facial deformities who may be better treated with full fixed orthodontics, but will demand clear aligners. We need to work with the orthodontist to be able to help with these patients because the management can be sometimes a little bit challenging. I'm going to specifically look at some of the clear aligner technologies. I'm going to look at the orthodontic limitations, talk about some of the surgical challenges, and also look at the benefits and the outcomes and some of the things that we've found over the past few years. Current aligner technologies are numerous. There are about 35 companies now worldwide that will be able to provide orthodontists with clear aligners for orthodontic movement. However, there's also now a certain trend in specific orthodontic communities for rapid prototyping and splint development even in-house. So it's very interesting to see how this will unfold over time. There are numerous orthodontic challenges in using clear aligner therapies. Overall, it's pretty difficult to get some anchorage. It's not very good with treating severe crowding. Closing extraction spaces can be a challenge. Mesializing a tooth. If teeth are misshaped or round or peg shaped, they sometimes are hard to en engage. It's hard to upright teeth, extrude teeth, and in the end, and I'll show you, also hard to get some really fine finishing. The surgical orthodontic challenges are really specific because it sees a, it's a new industry. How do we come about this? And also initially, and some tips that I'll provide, orthodontists and also clear liner therapy does not understand decompensations because it's meant for com compensatory treatment. But over time, this has improved. You need to know what ClinCheck is. ClinCheck is the ability for the orthodontist and the technician to go over how the number of steps and the number of trays. So that little box here just shows you, play it again, all the little jumps are the different trays. So it's a 3D virtual occlusal plan. You also have to know what attachments are. So Patients will have these little attachments on all their teeth that will help provide some torque in the movements as the trays are applied. ClinCheck is important because some of the disadvantages early on were again that compensatory treatment. Here, for example, is the cases of two uh, images of the same case showing what the steps are properly derived and dictated by the orthodontist and myself in order to decompensate the occlusion as best as possible. So when we can see a setup like this, then we're happy to see the change. If you can see on the upper panel, there's a certain portion here where it jumps, and that's where the surgery is uh, planned. And we know I have QR codes during this presentation. If you can just hover your phone over this QR code, it will give you this checklist that I have next, which is a little bit detailed, but it is a good framework for both surgeon and orthodontist in order to plan cases. So this checklist goes over what problems we have. If the patients are not undergoing surgery, they need to be compensated. And if the patients are having surgery, they need to be decompensated. For example, if the anterior-posterior relationship, if a patient is not going to have surgery, then that AP relationship has to be improved. If they are going to have surgery, it has to be maintained or worsened, right? That's pre-surgical decompensatory treatment. The same occurs with midlines. If they're not having jaw surgery, then the midlines can be corrected with IPR, extraction or movements. But if they're having surgery, the midline needs to be maintained, especially if it's skeletal, because you're going to make those changes. So orthognathic surgery with clear liners can be a challenge. The prescription and control is not really perfect. Some cases are hard to treat. Premolar extractions, deep class two, div twos are hard to treat. But also I find some cases are easier to treat. If you're doing surgery first, I kind of lean towards surgery early. 
A multi-segment maxilla is a breeze with clear liners. And there are many challenges in the intraoperative fixation because you have these aligners and sometimes the attachments. You can put on Eric arch bars. You can put on TADs, but these are too big. The patients won't let you do some of these things. I will apply, instead of IMF screws, the uh, rigid fixation screw. This is a 1.85 screw, and I'll use that as my TAD because it's a little smaller and easier to tolerate. We can apply these uh, uh, larger fixation retain devices. However, it's the same argument as the air guard spars. The patient still won't tolerate that either. Very early on, I used to have the orthodontist put on the brackets on the CEJ. This is a little bit more cumbersome, but this worked well initially. There are little buttons that the aligner companies sometimes place. These are not good at all, especially in a surgical environment, because if they fall off tiny pieces of glass, they fall on the wound, you'll never find them again. You can put the patient back into uh, um, orthodontic appliances. But again, these are patients that don't want orthodontic appliances. And this is the last thing they'll want. So over time, we develop the clear aligners. And these are larger splints that are able to fit into place. For example, on this case here, on the on your left panel, you can see the patient in temporary intermaxillary fixation with the chaos splint, clear aligner splint in place, and then with everything removed immediately post-op. I'd love to be able to say I get this all the time, but this is something that works very well because the occlusion and also the separation between the maxilla and mandible are very thin. So clear aligner orthognatic splints, nicknamed chaos splints. Uh, if you hover over the QR code, there's an article that we published a number of years ago, and this was for surgeons on how to better help sort of a technical aspect in the surgery. And this is what the splints look like in the upper left panel. So these are intended to be used on patients who don't have braces. I even use this on patients for maxillomandibular advancements who aren't undergoing orthodontic therapy. The dentition needs to be clear of attachments and the tray is designed so that it grabs, it undercuts, it snaps into place. It does two things. It will position your osteotomized jaw and provide maxillo uh, mandibular fixation stability. And also in segmental cases, and I'll show you, it'll help you torque in. So here's a planned case with the clear liner in the maxilla, segmentalized and full fixed in the mandible. And this just shows the benefits of digital planning. And I think we're all uh, on that bandwagon. It works very well, particularly in segmental cases, because you can rotate the pieces very well. If you have full fixed braces on this, this is harder to grab onto, and it's harder to position. And the simple wire pulling on the bracket tends to over, over buckly rotate that segment using a clear liner splint that will snap into place and also fits quite well afterwards. Just to show you a case, class three asymmetry and mandibular prognathism, maxillary retrognathia, treated with double jaw surgery, simple Laforte advancement and sagittal split setback. Here is pre-op of pan and ceph. And here are the splints that we used during the procedure. So full coverage of all the teeth in the maxilla and mandible. This would be the intermediate splint positioning the mandible. I do mandible first. And then the final splint positioning the maxilla. And these will snap into place and help us apply the fixation. This is my typical fixation pattern. This is immediately post-op, pan and ceph. And this is two weeks post-op showing a couple of things. First is the stability of the occlusion. There's contact and how I use these elastics and the screws. And also to demonstrate the, the diminished amount of swelling. There's very little swelling in these patients. And I think it might be due to the plaque, and, um, uh, less of a plaque burden. This is a patient one and a half years later, a good stable result. Here he is pre and post-op. But if you look really carefully, you can see that just on the very bottom, that root torque doesn't happen, and that's a deficiency of the clear liners. I think with full fix, that would have been treat, but this is just a little tweak about it. It's not perfectly well. What happens if you expand the maxilla? One of the, uh, we're publishing a paper on just using these little horseshoe splints. So after you've segmentalized it, so you have your case, you put in your splint, you remove the MMF, and then you can put in this horseshoe shaped plastic it's very rigid. It's attached to the teeth. I just take two little wires to hook it together. And this is very rigid, so it'll help preventing. And this can stay in place for a long period of time. Here's another case just showing the exact same splint, how it fits nicely. 
and this was a, a midline segmental. It is a little tricky putting it in, so what I recommend is first put the wires in the splint and then put the wires through the teeth. You kind of helicopter it in place, one of my residents called it. Another option is to use the clear aligner splint, just as I'd shown you there, and then intra-op, I take an acrylic burr, I cut off the top, I remove all the mandibular indentations, and this now acts as a tray. I have a little elastics I'll cut into it so that it'll hold in place for a couple of weeks, two, three, four weeks, depending on the movements and the expansion you have. Here demonstrating another case of a segmental expansion, pre-op and post-op, and this is an image of a reclusion pre-op and post-op with good settling. So you do uh, have great control. Finally, I want to provide with you some tips on what to say to your orthodontist or things that I've learned that will help with the orthodontic portion. The first is to the orthodontist to remove all the uh, aligners and attachments five weeks beforehand. At four weeks, have delivered to the patient four passive aligners. I see the patient four weeks pre-op to do the workup. I invite them to set the occlusion. I set all the occlusions digitally. And then the next time they see the patient is six weeks post-op. I do not have them touch the patient. And hopefully at six weeks post-op, the patient's able to open up for them to close. I've also set uh, a couple of recommendations for oral surgeons. If you want to hover over this, it'll produce a small article on just a couple of tips on, on how to get involved uh, with successfully, or basically the mistakes that I've made or some of the frustrations ironed out a little bit. So I, I do the pre-surgical workup four weeks ahead. I make sure the patient presents with their passive aligners and no attachments. Um, during the session, I, uh, the digital session, I make sure that my engineer understands what the chaos splint is. I use two of the larger manufacturers and they know exactly what I mean and they, they cover the entire teeth. They are designed not to involve the undercuts, but you do need to express to them that you, have, you need the undercuts involved uh, uh, for that retention. Um, during surgery, I try in the splint, see how much retention. Sometimes it's not fully snapping in, so I might have to add a few tads. And now by habit, I just tend to add four tads anyhow because I need them for my post-op elastics. Segmental cases, make sure you have another splint or at least shave down your chaos splint. Uh, sometimes in segments, I might place a little blob of composite resin or even a wire between the teeth. Uh, in open bite cases, I tend not to leave the splint in place. Post-op, I use small little tads. I use the fixation screws, and I, I uh, build that ortho is not to see the patient until six weeks afterwards so they can jump, they can scan for the post-jump aligners. So in the world of clear aligner therapy, jump is the surgery, so a post-surgical aligner, post-jump aligner. Elastics can be controlled, and I showed you this picture before, either with our little tads or with cutting little grooves of plastic. I just use a 701 burr, 702 burr, and I fix the elastic onto the trays. So finally, just a few tips. Make sure you remove all the attachments before scanning. Have the orthodontist make four passive aligners, two for before surgery and two for after. Um, hold the segments with some composite. I use fixation screws instead of MMF screws. I really like using the clear aligner orthognathic splint, the chaos splint. Make sure they don't fabricate post-jump aligners. They have to rescan after surgery. Sometimes I'll try to get in there two to three weeks post-op and I'll scan it for the orthodontist. That's a good way to make friends because it's hard for them to open and they really hesitate getting in there. But if I can jump in there with my assistant, she's really good at it. Two, three weeks later, she'll do the STL and send it to the orthodontist. They'll love you for that. Um, I, I'll use the aligners to hold the elastics. Uh, and in segmental cases, I prefer actually using the chaos uh, splint. So the initial observations uh, there's low level, level of evidence. So I'm going to show you a little study that we're producing. It's just the numbers are small. Um, there are two movement limitations. You have to do this with complete digital planning. Some post report bites are, are not very good fine finishing. And it can take a long time for MMF if you're doing other things. But as I showed you, if you're using the chaos splint, it's actually quicker. So advantages, I find it's faster. Segmental effort control is fantastic. Patients love it. It's good for surgery first. 
the hygiene afterwards. It's a breeze to suture, and it's also very clean afterwards. And then all the other reasons why patients are doing clear liners. So uh, I currently have about 115, 120 orthognathic cases performed with clear aligners, and I'm looking at 25 cases with matched controls, which we'll be submitting for publication later on in the year, showing that basically the outcomes are not that different. And the spoiler alert is that the fine finishing using the OGS scale of the American Association of Orthodontics is not that exact the same, but it's uh, uh, no different than your outcomes with full fixed versus uh, Invisalign orthodontic therapy. So I do think it's a suitable option for our patients. Uh, hopefully um, we might see you in Toronto one of these days for our meetings. If you do come to Toronto, this is my office right over here. I hope you enjoyed my talk and enjoy the rest of the meeting. And again, just the QR codes handout and also references if you were interested. And if anyone needs to just email me for further questions, it's more than a pleasure. Thank you once again for the honor.